So, um, welcome, Tess, to the Artist Talk as part of your exhibition at the session, currently running until April 18. The, show ex the show is entitled Return to Vienna, the paintings of Tess Geray, and it's not a retrospective as such. It's an overview, let's say, but with a strong focus of work from, with a few historical works, but a strong focus on your current practice right within the context of the ideas of the session. So um, I don't know if I introduce, have to introduce you much further. People are participating in this artist talk. They probably will know or have read about you, but born in 1937 in Vienna, emigrated in 1938, correct? Correct. And um, have been, uh, grew up in the English countryside, has been uh, working with art, um, for many, many decades by now, as well as being a painter in her own right, also teaching uh, for many years at the Slate. Actually, I believe you were the first woman art teacher at Slate, correct? It's amazing, but yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, it is actually amazing. It's astonishing that this needs to be still um, uh, made a point out of, actually, but, it, yes. you know, it is. So, um, the exhibition is called Return to Vienna, and it is your first institutional, if we can call this a session, as an, if we can call it an institution, I think, which we can, um, first institutional solo show in Vienna, in Austria, the country where you were born in, the city of birth. And um, of course, you've had a few other showings in your uh, biography in Austria, but this is the first sort of thorough acknowledgement of your artistic practice in your hometown. So now I'm, uh, I'm told to also introduce myself uh, oh. briefly, very briefly. It's a bit weird. Usually Sylvia from the Friends of Secession would do that, but um, as this is a digital thing we're doing here and not a real talk, well, it is a real talk, but it's digital. So um, I'm supposed to introduce myself. My name is Christian Siegmeier. Tess kindly in, uh, invited me um, to, to talk to uh, uh, her about uh, the exhibition as part of an artist talk that is uh, organized by the friends of the session, um, here represented through Silvia Liska sitting next to me listening. Um, I uh, run a gallery in uh, for many years. I used to run a gallery in Berlin for 10 years, where actually our first exhibition test was together in 2018, really not that long ago. And um, uh, then I moved the gallery actually for not so much only for art reasons, but also for personal reasons to Vienna, where I showed your work in a two-part exhibition um, called East of the West. The title uh, is from you, Tess in 2019. And out of these developments, let's say, um, we're sitting now here inside the building of Secession, or I am sitting inside Secession, um, the library upstairs, um, in a way, an irony that um, you are displaced again from this exhibition for other reasons. Um, and I have to be here and can't sit here with you directly. So I think that's a good introduction for now. It's also odd because we can't have questions at the end from people. Maybe a good thing. Maybe a good thing. You wanted to start with reading a little a paragraph? Um, yes, I thought I would. Thank you anyhow for that, Kristen. Nice introduction. And I would like to say that it is really through Kristen that I am at the secession at all. Um, so I hope he knows, I hope you know that I really appreciate that because the secession has been a, a name in my mind since I was a teenager. When I was a teenager, of course, like all teenagers, I fell in love with, with Klimt and with Sheila. Uh, I, I have to say that's not a love affair that has remained. Um, but I probably would be retarded if it had. Um, <laughs> okay. So, so I do want to thank you, Christian, for having made all this possible. Um, and of course, you know, everybody at the session, everybody has been lovely and made me feel so welcome. 
Uh, and let me just say one other thing, which is I thought of the other day, and that is <clears throat> my idea of secession started when I was, you know, in my late teens. And actually, I've had no contact with it until now. Therefore, my image of it remains. There's nothing of those 50 or whatever years that has, has destroyed that the idealism Mm -hmm. which it was set up and I'm you know it's I'm very impressed to see that a lot of that obviously is going on though no doubt <clears throat> more complicated now mm -hmm. so I have kind of self-wiped all all those years whatever that means okay That's fantastic. I will I will start I thought it might help um if I just read a piece it won't take more than less than two minutes mm -hmm. um that I took from, from one of the books I wrote on the subject of space, which of course in the end is without which there wouldn't be any paintings. Mm. So I, a lot of it is asking questions. So I say, what exactly is the nature of the space that a painter makes on a canvas? Where is it in relation to the kind of space we understand that may be looked out on from a high point or enclosed within four walls. When painters make space, are they increasing, adding to the amount of space that already exists in the world? Or are they making another space altogether, one that doesn't relate to what is already there? <clears throat> it can't be quite like the space reflected in a mirror, because that is just what it's called, mirror image and illusion, and doesn't really add anything to the world. And it is not like the space that Moses made when he parted the waves, because presumably the water just piled up higher on either side, liberating the part in between. In many cases, the space created by a painter seems strangely infinite, more than when one is gazing at the stars or at the horizon or at a photograph of the earth taken from the moon. Where is that space and what is it pointing to? Is it pointing as much back to us as outwards? And if it is, where is that space? Of course, when you look at a painting in which the space seems particularly assertive, say, Piero's flagellation, <clears throat> or one of Matisse's Morocco paintings, we know it is an illusion on a flat surface. But for those moments when our disbelief is suspended, is more, it is more than an illusion, it's a journey. We are transported somewhere. Does that occur in our vision, in our heads or hearts, or out there somewhere in another space altogether, or at some special meeting place between the two? But whatever it is, it must surely add to the sum total of the space that, that exists in our world. Um, and with this, we're going to end this talk. Thank you very much, Tess. That was a perfect <laughs> summary of your work uh, and very eloquent. By the way, without advertising, I would like to say that Tess is also the author of a couple of very fantastic books, um, like where she reflects on her life as well as on art, as she does here. Um, I now, from uh, my side, wanted to start by something this morning um, I had, because I was feeling slightly nervous, and um, I was uh, speaking to an, a young artist in Vienna um, by a social media who just saw your show uh, and very much enjoyed it, he said. And he said something that really brings this on the point, in a sense. He said, what's so amazing about the show downstairs in the same building where I'm sitting in now that you actually haven't seen yourself because you are not able to come until now due to Corona. Um, he said, what's so amazing about the show is that you can zoom in in different ways. You can zoom in and zoom out of the work. So you can perceive it from a large distance. So you're very far away from the painting, but you can also be very close to the piece. And I thought that was a really beautiful comment he made because that really is what the show downstairs is in line with what you just read. It's about, que it's about questions of space and about paintings in space as well as about extension of lines beyond a canvas maybe. Um, and the, the space downstairs is, even though you haven't seen it at this point, you have to operate like so often in your life from memory. 
Um, I think the last time you were at the session is um, it's it's been a couple of um, it's been a while. Uh, well, of course, I was in Vienna for my show with you, which was two or three years ago. The session itself, I actually was there about 12 years ago. 12 years ago. So, I mean, and the space downstairs is very, um, very architectural, very sort of geometrical, very, um, very grid oriented, so to say. Um, so, um, so are your works. So I was quite interested when, um, when uh, this young artist brought up this this um, this comment about the work, which to me seems to speak for the exhibition downstairs. Yes, I, I, I think that's true. It, it is actually a difficult place for artists. I suspect that when it was built, the architect, was it Ulrich? Like most architects, he had his way um, and wasn't terribly interested in how paintings looked. On the other hand, it's very easy to, to change. I imagine that, you know, the curators can move from paintings to, to sculpture. But, uh, and there is a nice thing that, uh, about it. Although you can't see the thing all at once, you can have surprises. You can actually walk around corners. Right. Um, and then, as you say, you can walk up close to them. So I don't know what the ideal space is, frankly. I mean, I still probably like, you know, the, the conventional white box, there is something about that, but, the, you know, the, the space of succession is also very large. So, you know, I think works have to assert themselves in the right kind of way, which is not to do with size, of course, it's to mm -hmm. do with their presence. Indeed. And this is something that you bring quite to the point with the focus also on the recent work in the show. Um, because you actually investigate, uh, amongst other things, in, in your recent work, round paintings, which prove um, quite a, a, a painterly problem um, in itself, correct? Yes, it was, um, I actually found it very, very interesting. I had no intention uh, of doing round paintings, but round paintings appeared in the victory uh, series, mm, which that's right. there. That's right. And they were more or less inspired by um, <clears throat> one of the rare pieces of architecture in Piero's painting. Mm -hmm. uh, having done those rivals, I thought, you know, I don't know what I thought actually. I can't remember. But anyhow, I I had the nerve to to get some round boards made. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, I started thinking about it, and. I realized that historically there are actually very, very few great round paintings. Right. There's the okay. famous one of Christ from Mantegna. I think that's how you pronounce it. Yes. There is a, there is a very beautiful uh, round world by <clears throat> Raphael, Mother and Child. Mm -hmm. Yes. But on the whole, those, those works are usually set into an architectural setting, mm. which of course is quite different. Mm -hmm. So um, I then thought, actually, there is there is no really satisfactory way of working with roundels other than asserting the center, mm -hmm. because a round is a very very powerful geometric shape. Mm -hmm. Probably, probably or possibly, the the most assertive that, that there is. A square is also uh, assertive, mm -hmm. but a rectangle which most painters use, mm -hmm. has a wonderful, a wonderful sense of uh, neutrality. It's mm. almost as though those edges don't exist. Right. You feel absolutely free, but with a round painting, you don't have that freedom. No. Um, and in fact, I, ha I wasn't able to break that, that all of them, all of them are focused on the center. Mm -hmm. and it's rather rare that you can just put a tiny, basically a little dot in the middle of a work and it activates a surface. So I, I believe there is a, an edge of humor to those works. Okay. Um, and I quite like that thought. Um, and I remember when I was teaching, we discussed that with the students and we, we agreed in the end that the majority of our works have something of the humorous about them, and that it's probably to do with 
scale, the difference between large and small. Um, even, I mean, it's quite difficult to imagine having a good laugh in front of Rothko. I don't think it's like that. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, there is something about the way those the paint is put on that maybe it's just a way of making you feel humor, human, and humor is part of being being human. Yeah, I agree with you. A, li a little knot in the middle is, you know, why bother? But actually, I did bother, and it, it was a lot of fun, and I, you know, I, I quite, I quite liked them. Interesting, because uh, it's just a blip, a dot in the in in this in this in, within the exhibition. It's it's uh, if I look at the smaller ones of the round paintings, it's it's a dot within a huge space um, that is predominantly white, except for the other pieces. And on that dot, when you zoom in, and the zoom lens is also something round. I mean, these days, many young artists don't even know really so much what the zoom lens necessarily is. But in an old photographic context, it is something you you know zoom into, and it's a round object. And then you have another dot on that. And that's actually really interesting because that brings me to my next question, that um, there are three, five... I don't know. I don't. I apologize if I call these historical pieces. I hope you don't mind. I mean, I got it, call them whatever you want. Okay. So uh, pieces from the '60s, from the early stages of your career, so to say, as an artist. Um, so these five old pieces are not hung within the show itself. They are sort of in a side wing of the space and offer a kind of um, the the beginning point of a narrative of your practice even though, again, it's not a retrospective, it's, it's, a, it's a show about the current artist working and living, Tess Jaray. But I felt that these old paintings in, in relation to the newer paintings, um, even though they tell a story um, of artistic development, let's say, they offer a slightly different um, uh, um, approach in a way they feel more, um, concerned with the um, with with the space within the painting and optical illusions within the paintings, the four corners of the painting themselves. Well, I felt that the newer paintings, for example, 100 Years of Predella, as an example, sort of extend, they just ignore the edges of the four corners of the painting's world and extend almost further through space. Uh, that's that's a difficult question. I think the early ones that you're referring to, um, I was very young when I painted those. I was in my 20s. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I don't think that, I mean, I thought then that a lot of thought had gone into them. But you do, do not know as much about the world or about painting, or you have no great understanding of how to make a painting in your 20s, it takes experience, but say what you do have is that wonderful energy and fearlessness. I mean, if I now look at those paintings closely, that I would never accept some of the rough surfaces, for instance. Right. And so many brush marks and so on. And there's a kind of casualness that I think probably works because of that. You know, it's, it's like finding the world for the, for, for, for the first time. Mm -hmm. And then as you move on, of course, you become more thoughtful. Uh, and then sadly, possibly that thoughtfulness turns into being absolutely neurotic. Um, <laughs> and uh, um. in a way, that's that's just how it goes. You you And also, yeah. I think over the years, the works have simplified. Mm -hmm. That's true. I do try... Uh, and always to now <clears throat> to simplify them as much as I possibly can. And from time to time, and I think I may be at one of those moments, you simplify things down so much that actually there's nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to simplify than to, com to, than to complicate. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. then it seems an affectation. And painting is in such a strange period at the moment there are you know it's not an accepted mode of working for artists anymore mm. although people say that there's just as much paint as there always was that may be possible I don't know how one can tell um, so I am frightened of putting something into a painting that may be seen as purely decorative now I'm all in favor of the decorative <clears throat> 
I'd hate to think of life without it, but there is a difference between just decorative and decorative. So it's just decorative I want to get rid of, but I want to use the decorative in order to insert something else. And very often that thing is scale. Mm-hmm. But of course, I would like it to refer to all kinds of other things. And now I've forgotten what your question was. <laughs> and I've forgotten also <laughs> what my question really was. But um, I can move on because I've made these little cards that I can uh, slip oh, around. Good. And um, that brings me up to um, issues, uh, maybe, because this is an artist-run and led organization from the beginning. A couple of, I mean, and I am not a painter. I used to be an artist. Maybe I know a little bit and understand a little bit the concerns, but um, I am not a working artist for a long time. I've changed sides, so to say. But I wanted to ask... Um, about um, the construction and the, of the pieces, because there were uh, a couple of things that are really interesting to me and that you just brought up as well. In the old paintings, you said, like, today you wouldn't accept these rough edges anymore. Um, and I heard from someone uh, from Costas, I think, who's uh, working with you, that you are a big fan of this uh, frog tape, which is this new fancy tape um, that doesn't fancy masking tape that doesn't leave these like grizzly edges as you have, still have them in the old paintings. Well, it's interesting to think, I've, I've mentioned this before, but it's interesting to think that when I started painting in the 1960s, masking tape was the equivalent of high technology now, <laughs> which is a little bit like comparing it to going to Mars. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we thought how absolutely wonderful we can now make straight lines mm-hmm. and that must have stuck in some kind of way. Uh, I never had that much problem with the old tape because I would run a nail along it and then I would paint on top of it very carefully. Um, but also, you know, a painting is more than just paint and it's more than just lines. It's also right. the canvas underneath and the stretcher and the context and so on. <clears throat> so... Um, it depends very much, for instance, if you use linen, then it's a very different thing from using cotton duck, which is what I do and have done for, for, for many years. And using linen, which is a wonderful, wonderful material, but really you have to wash it first in the washing machine and then iron it and then stretch it and it doesn't stretch properly. You know, people do tend to think, oh, well, you know, it's easy. You just you just stick paint, paint on a canvas and, and that's that. But I'm afraid it's not. There is a lot of physical work to it. Mm-hmm. 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 So, so masking tape has remained with me. You see, some artists have a great ability to make a beautiful mark naturally. Mm-hmm. I would say, you know, Matisse, for instance. However he put the paint down, it was expressive. Mm-hmm. Or However, he put the paint down, it was expressive. De Kooning, Rothko, it, you know, I, I never felt I had that. So that the tape allowed me to, and of course, emerging in the 1960s was also probably a lucky time for me, and because you were allowed, you were permitted to make large areas of contained color. Right. One of the reasons that I don't want any interference with edges and so on is I I really want um, all the attention to be on the quality of the space that's created, which is created in part by color. Mm -hmm. So anything that distracts from that, Mm -hmm. I try and avoid. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's a color in a way, as I'm sure you know, doesn't exist on its own. Mm-hmm. Color only exists in relation to other colors. It's very, very difficult to get a sense of a color mm-hmm. if it's on its own. You really have to saturate an entire environment, probably with light, mm-hmm. and even then it begins to fade. Whereas if you put another one color next to a color, the juxtaposition brings about an activity. Correct. Because you can never quite separate one from the other. Correct. That's a really excellent point that you bring up. And for example, in one of the pieces, one of your old pieces, um, early Piazza, uh, when we were showing it two years ago in Vienna uh, for the first time, and had uh, time, I had time, or within in numerous, one of the great things about running a gallery is that you have numerous discussions with people about the same subject matter during the course of the show, and hear a lot of different opinions, and also really educate yourself through that. 
And when we were looking at early Piazza over the time, we realized, because before I only knew it from a JPEG, that it actually consisted of, I think it was five or six colors. And um, while on a JPEG, our sort of digital brain turns it into a graphic and I only see two colors, but actually the subtlety of the colors is very, very beautiful. And there's another thing I wanted to ask you in relation to that, um, the technology issue, of course, um, uh, masking tape. At the time, of course, you were happy with masking tape because you didn't miss rock tape because it doesn't exist, maybe. The same maybe goes for oil versus acrylic because your early works are in oil, but then with the emergence of acrylic, you change to acrylic. Yes. And um, <clears throat> another thing that you just said I wanted to quickly um, uh, pick up on, I know we could talk forever, but... Um, it is the issue of being a woman painter in relationship. So the, so the question of gender within painting in general, and specifically the uh, question of um, the usual uh, idea of the male painterly gesture, you know, the Pollocky moment of expressiveness on paint. And I'm not really talking so much about or want to talk so much about the the art historical or the, the particular practice, but the relationship to gender. And um, in your case, when you say you, your, your reduction uh, to color plane and lines, which seems, and geometries or visualization, abstractions of space, that seems usually uh, that's something that's at least historically connotated uh, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a rather male um, activity, so to say. So I just wanted to pick up on you, uh, pick your brain a little bit about the idea of uh, about gender and your role as a woman artist. Huh. How long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> you have for it's, this answer, you have uh, thirty seconds now. Thirty yeah. seconds. Well, that's that's that's. You really can take a minute or two. Thank you so much. Um, you're very kind. You can also take longer, but you know it's. Uh, we don't want to bore our non-existent at this point audience. No, we, we, we don't. It, I, I think it's a very difficult and, and very complicated question. And it's also uh, something that's changed hugely over my working life. Right. So I have to say that as a student, I wasn't really aware, aware of it. Uh, that is to say the, the, the difference between the genders. Well, I, I was aware of the difference between genders, but not in the painterly way. Right. Um, I was able to distinguish men from women. Yes, yes, I understand what you mean. <laughs> I'm not so sure I can now, actually. Well, you know, the, there's new generations emerging, uh, the they, them right. phenomena, of course. Exactly. Well, good luck to them. And um, we were a very serious bunch of people. What was important was painting. Mm. And everybody was perfectly civil to me, and I made lots of friends, some of whom I still have. Uh, so at that time, it didn't really seem an issue. I, looking back, I wondered whether they were so nice to me because uh, fundamentally they thought, well, it's all right, she's a woman, it doesn't count. Mm. It's not threatening. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there may be some truth in that. Mm -hmm. Is there such a thing as female painting? Um, there is if the artist chooses it to be. I mean, we've had plenty of women's art movements. <clears throat> Some were very interesting. Um, I happen not to be interested. I mean, I'm essentially just mainstream. You know, my, my interest in art goes back to the Renaissance, to the Middle Ages, to cave painting. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we even know who did those wonderful cave paintings. Maybe it was the women, mm -hmm. um, while the men were out throwing Hunting. spears. Mm -hmm. Maybe not. Maybe the women were out throwing spears and remember this. So I don't think I have any huge insight, but I can tell you undoubtedly that it is more difficult. You do have to work harder as a woman artist. Um, and there are people who will not even look at women artists. And the mistake I made now was not changing my name uh, at a very early stage and make it you know, a, a bi-gender name. For instance, had I been called Sam, mm -hmm. then that could be Sam for Sam or it could be Sam for Samantha's mother. We'll never know uh, unless we come back and, and try 
it all again. Um, so I think it, it still exists. Mm -hmm. But for me, what is important in the end is what happens in the studio, what I'm doing with my work, <clears throat> and I'm not going to worry about it. But I believe everybody essentially, the art they make is essentially coming from somewhere very true within them. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I don't think you can make a fake painting um, and have everybody believe in it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, being female is no doubt part of what I am. So in some way, that probably shows. Does it matter? I wouldn't have thought so. Okay. Very well. Very well said. And um, a good answer, I think, in relation also to your practice. We could obviously extend this conversation about gender and feminism in, in art and history and uh, and society much, much longer. But um, I guess I have no, to... That's a big subject. It's a, it's, it's it's a, a big, big subject. subject. And... Um, 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 it is something that is incredibly relevant, but uh, something we maybe have to leave for another time. Um, I want to do a quick de detour now from um, actually from the painting, which is the, the core of your practice, to, um, if, if I call it three-dimensionality, let's say, I don't know if you would call it sculptural uh, as such, um, because it still operates on, on, on a plane, even though it has steps to it. Um, downstairs in the exhibition, there is only uh, two small pieces from this um, this body of work called Thorns um, that have a slight idea that most people actually might miss in the exhibition. They have a they are slightly these pieces are quite different. They have a slight idea of three dimensionality to it. Um, it's also a time when you embraced um, um, again. I mean, you're using computers for. Um, maybe as long as I do. I mean, it's, uh, it's quite remarkable. You're much better an illustrator than I ever will be. Mm -hmm. um, but um, they have a slight three-dimensionality to them. And I want to come back also to the first show we did together and to your site-specific, if you don't mind me using that word, piece Aleppo in King's Cross. Yes. So do you mm -hmm. see these as paint? Do you, first of all, do you see them as sculpture or do you see them as what what are these for you? These slight three dimensionalities. It's a very interesting question. Um, in those particular ones, in the Aleppo ones, not so much at King's Cross, um, there is a, there is a literal physical element of three dimensionality. In the paintings, I because <clears throat> they you know they were cut mm -hmm. and the edges were important. I don't really want them to look sculptural. Uh, the small ones, the paper was cut, therefore the it's a very, yeah. very, you know, hardly visible edge. Half a millimetre. Yeah. Half a millimetre, exactly. Uh, so I don't think it's, it's it, it, it has to be there because in the end when you work so simply, everything has to be appropriate and has to be exact. Although you may not you know, know what you want until you start. In fact, I never know what I want until I start. Um, King's Cross was slightly different. That was a, co a commission uh, where I was offered a wall of a certain size. Everything had to fit in. In other commissions I've done, in a way, things were more interesting because that was rather out of my sphere of understanding so I had to learn a lot mm -hmm. something like the space in Birmingham well that's been pulled down now but the space in Wakefield which I hugely enjoy doing you then have to take on board what it's for mm -hmm. and that of course is not something anybody does with the painting a painting is not for anything right um, it's a question of purpose you're right mm -hmm. it, yes so that for instance, in Wakefield, which is an, 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 a very nice, smallish city uh, in the north of England, it was only called a city as opposed to a town because mm -hmm. it had a cathedral and Queen Victoria said this should be now called a city. Okay. And, voilà. and um, I worked there. I didn't work with architects. I worked with engineers, and that was a huge pleasure because we were in no way competitive. Ah. I, when I work with with architects, and the, the, so many architects secretly want to have been painters, and actually, so many 
artists probably want to have been architects, but they yeah. did badly in maths at school like I did, so they mm. didn't go that way. Mm. Um, but the engineers were very interested in my ideas, and um, I looked to them for for all the help I needed in actually stabilizing, you know, what could have been rather ephemeral ideas. And there was a space around the cathedral, which was actually a terrible mess. There was a bit of grassy bank and so on. And initially they said they just wanted paving. And I looked at it and I thought, if I just do paving, because at that time I was well known for working with bricks and brick mm -hmm. patterns. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and I said, if we just do paving, you're just... It's just cosmetic. Nobody's going to be interested. It's not going to make much difference. Why don't we be more radical and take away all this awfulness and, and insert a Something. series of stone steps around the cathedral, which would unify with the cathedral. Mm -hmm. um, and the stone could also be used to frame any brickwork as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a wonderful learning curve for me mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. you know, I had to work out, for instance, how deep does a step have to be in order to walk comfortably up it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, if it's too wide, do you take one step? Do you take right. two steps? All mm -hmm. so that the the human our human behavior uh, was something that I had to take on board, mm -hmm. and that was really very very interesting. Um, yeah, I think in all of these uh, um, uh, uh, public commissions or. Um, you have done. You've done quite a few, and there's a book uh, about your public works as well that we will show uh, in a in a JPEG uh, when this talk is edited. Um, um, it's interesting because it's as you say, as you said, it's a it's a very different purpose for um, for these 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 commissions, but they are still you in your in within your practice. They seem to make the most perfect sense as well, and they don't seem to have what a lot of what I hear a lot from artists that they have, that they want to do these uh, works on site or uh, commissions, but are not really comfortable with it. Or there's a lot of examples around the world, I guess, where um, in public spaces, the, the, the works of artists don't really succeed so well um, because there's this slight sort of uncomfortableness with the artists sometimes extending beyond their usual practice into this particular yeah. field. And in your case, it seems quite a, quite a logical extension. And there's one piece actually um, at Victoria Station in London. Is, is That's still there, right? That's still there, nearly 40 years now. Can you imagine how many millions of people have walked over that piece? Yes, well, that was the first serious piece I ever did. And in a way, uh, it was not... I couldn't aspire to what I later could aspire to and make it really contextual because it was it, it was very limited. Right. Um, so certainly I was given the material, which was terrazzo. I had to work with in terrazzo. But I also did direct it a little bit, slightly around the corner so that the people were um, helped in finding their direction when they went to a particular uh, platform. <clears throat> yeah. So that, you know, that was a, a good lesson. Um, and do you learned, know, yeah, go ahead. I Sorry. learned about things like grouting, for instance. I became absolutely obsessed by grouting between the, you know what grouting is, do you? That's, that's a, the, that's how you fix true. bricks or stone together. It's mm -hmm. the, the concrete that you put between them. Right. And I remember, you know, we had a meeting and I, I wanted to have a sort of dull gray pink. And I said to the, to, um, the committee there, or to this person in the committee who was dealing with it, um, what kind of colors can I have for grouting? And I still remember, he said, oh, you can have any color you, lo you like, so long as it's gray. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that, right. that was a very good lesson to learn. You know, mm -hmm. there, are, there are huge limitations. Right, right, right. So, you know, that was, you know, that was very interesting. That was the first one that, that I did. It's still there. It's in rather a mess, but they have mended it, which is very nice after 40 years. So many people have seen it. And I'm not, I mean, you don't know how it relates to my history as well, because I'm one of the people, I mean, I've walked across it a million times, probably not a million, but many times, but um, because I lived in London for six years, as you know. But when I moved to London in 1997, 
to as an Erasmus exchange student, um, which was highly influential for me in a way, because even though I've traveled around before, I moved away for the first time. I have very strong memories. I remember that my flight was on British Airways from Berlin to, um, to Gatwick. So I arrived as a student um, in London on Victoria, at Victoria Station, not knowing anyone. And I was picked up by uh, the people I stayed with. I don't know where it was anymore in South London that I think I found via like Time Out London or something at the time. So I found myself a base where with these people that I stayed with. But I do remember it very vividly, even though I don't remember, of course, walking possibly across your piece. Um, but that's it's an interesting sort of small coincidence, which... Um, which brings me to uh, um, the next subject I wanted to talk to you briefly about before we have to uh, probably wrap up at some point. Um, we still have time. We still have time, it says. Okay. So I wanted to move on from this kind of particular moment, this wandering um, of me across your work in 1997 to the current moment where we sit here together now in this artist talk, virtually distant again or uh, not connect, connected, but only through some kind of digital stream, um, which to me seems like a very um, particular sort of um, Zebaldian moment in, in a, or a Zebaldian way of looking um, at life and, juxta and sort of cross connections between people. And uh, by Zebaldian, I mean for people who are not so familiar with that. Um, and I'm by, by no means a very, I have to admit, very literate person, but I have a great affinity for the works of W.G. Siebold, um, who um, also Tess uh, used to be a, a very good and close friend with before he passed away in 2004 in a car crash. 2001. Um, 2001, I apologize. 2001 in a car crash. And Tess published also a book together with him um, about his um, his poetry, correct? That yeah. you discovered or you, you saw and he never wanted published and then you would decide? No, I, I actually, I was with him one day up where he, he taught in uh, Norfolk. And I asked him, I said, do you, do you also write poetry? And that he just reached into a drawer and took out a very long poem, um, which was called, oh God, I've forgotten now, but I think it was something like Last Day in Marienbad. Okay. And <clears throat> it was in German, and as you know, my German is sadly not remotely as good as your English. It's very, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't understand it all, so I got it translated. And then, um, and then I thought, well, you know, Marian, but what you know? What what is this subject? It was mm -hmm. about love, and it was about the the end of someone's life, and so on. And just to cut a very long story short, mm -hmm. I discovered eventually uh, that it was actually from Goethe, who who had um, mm -hmm. who had written a poem on mm -hmm. uh, Marian Bart and uh, about falling in love with a young girl, and so on. Mm -hmm. So. Um, that's 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 how it happened, and then then he he sent me some more poems, just you know, out of the blue, and I thought, you know, somebody's got to make a book out of this, and I did. And unfortunately, the public the publishers printed five thousand copies. They sold three thousand copies. Um, wow. Okay. They. they um, what was it? It's very you rare. Know, they lost. They lost a thousand copies. Oh, oh well, as you do. I mean, well, I, I only have one or two left. That's yeah, and one you kindly gave me. It's uh, it's uh, it's something that I very much cherish and actually brought here today as well. All oh, right. Um, the reason I also wanted to bring up Sebald is um, uh, because before I even knew that you guys were uh, befriend, were friends and this book existed uh, when we first uh, planned the Aleppo show that uh, was our first collaboration in, Be in Berlin 2018, I came up uh, with a quote uh, from Austerlitz, uh, an excellent one of the books by Sebald, uh, as like the sort of like a, a quote at the beginning of the 
um, 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 the, the, the text to the exhibition that works looks at this work, Aleppo, which you created out of photos from um, Islamic architecture that you took in Aleppo prior to its destruction. And um, so that, that was like a, um, a, a quite a, again, sometimes these things happen when you, when you read Sebald that you have these weird sort of cross connections yes. that previously didn't seem to make much, make much of, you may, didn't make much of. And there is actually another one I wanted to point to that was actually your first showing in a long time in Vienna that um, was in 2018 at a gallery here in Vienna called Kroy Nielsen, where a piece of you was uh, shown of, uh, of in, in the context of a Sebald cura a show curate as part of curated by Vienna at Kroy Nielsen Gallery um, um, that dealt with Sebald. Um, and this piece is, uh, is, is a postcard or something, some kind of, uh, of um, of Ma uh, Marco Square in, in Venice, and you drew um, a crocodile on it, or like the outline of a crocodile. Is that right? That is right. That's I sent it to him, so it must have come out of his collection. Ah, so it came out of his collection. Or maybe, maybe, I can't remember to tell you, I don't know about this exhibition. Okay, okay, interesting. Um, because uh, remember, um, the piece is, um, yeah, it's a slightly, it's it's like an off, maybe something you did when you were in conversation with him, or because it's not really a piece or a drawing within the context of your work. It's it's more like um, a sketch. Yeah, we, we exchanged humorous, humorous drawings or humorous letters at at some point. I see. <clears throat> I think I made a crocodile because. There is a crocodile on the, in, in St. Mark's Square in Venice. I think so. I, that. I did a thing on that. I think so. So um, the show, coming back to the show briefly, I mean, I still have a couple of cards here. Some of them are very easy questions, but um, also fun, more fun questions. Um, um, uh, one question I wanted to uh, talk, the show is called Return to Vienna, the paintings of Tess Charest. Uh, as we've previously mentioned, it is a return to Vienna um, because it's the city of your birth. And um, you've shown here, and we hope that you you personally will be able to return to Vienna towards the end of the show by April 18, 2021 this year, so that you're actually able to see it. At the same time, also as a little uh, 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 announcement, so to say, I also wanted to bring up that there's someone else from your family who's going to be returning to Vienna, which is uh, the estate of uh, Richard Jarre, which is who, is your, who was your uncle. And um, his work, the remainder, his estate, um, uh, will return to Vienna as well permanently, which is fantastic. Um, Richard uh, was, uh, um, was your uncle, born in, I think, 1902, but um, perished in uh, the Shoah in 1942, uh, deported to Lodge in 1941, uh, murdered in 1942. I just wanted to bring that up because within the context of return to Vienna, it's another of your family, so to say, your extended family, who will have the opportunity to return to Vienna permanently. So, and now that's really uh, the last thing in, in terms of these more heavy things I wanted to talk about. I have a couple of questions, more like, uh, you know, like a talk show in a sense that I wanted to talk to you about in relation to what artists, um, into what, in relation to what uh, the session is. Um, in an, an interview with the Courier newspaper, uh, you did, um, you were talking about in the last paragraph, um, I, in, in, it's translated in German, but I just wanted to, I briefly translated it back, um, that you were saying something like along the lines, like artists are getting attention when they're young and old, yet there are these dif difficult 50, 50 years in between where you receive hardly any recognition at all. And out of that, which is something that I hear, of course, with the fascination or the, the obsession of the art world with youth and possibly age as well. There is that period in between. And uh, I hear that from many artists um, of that particular gap, gap year, so to say. 
uh, also in relation to their gender and uh, heritage, wh where they're really struggling and um, how to continue. And I wanted to ask you if you have any advice for artists in this period, let's say. Well, giving somebody advice for a period of 50 years would be rather well, hard. Um, I think I can only I can only say there are two things. Um, the most important one is if you don't feel obsessive about your work, mm -hmm. then it's going to be too difficult. Mm -hmm. If you're doing it only for reasons of money or success or to fill your time, forget it. Yeah. If you are the kind of person who thinks in terms of work, um, then it's easier because you want to do that and you'll find a way of doing it. But mm -hmm. then, of course, you do have to eat at the same time, mm -hmm. and that is very problematic. Mm -hmm. um, in this country, we have a very good system of, of art schools, perhaps not as good as it was, it was before, and the majority of artists, even almost even all the very successful ones, have spent some years teaching. Mm -hmm. because they would teach part-time, maybe maximum three days. Mm -hmm. In my view, artists don't have weekends. You know, you don't say, shall I go for a picnic on Saturday and um, meet my friends on Sunday. Saturday and Sunday are working days. Right. Um, I mean, that is the nature of obsession. It's the nature of obsession. So it's made it easier for a lot of artists. I mean, it's, it's easy, of course, as my father used to say, if you choose your parents carefully, uh, then you might, you might be able to be supported. But that doesn't, doesn't happen with very many. No. <laughs> and really, very few artists can manage just living off their work. But some, some do. Of um, course. Of so course. I, I think if you feel obsessive enough, then you don't have to worry. You'll find a way, but mm. nobody will... Will, should tell you it's easy. It's not easy. Right. It's not just the continuing. It's the fact that um, nobody is interested, and it's very difficult to get attention in those years. <clears throat> I mean, I've I've certainly been you know at least ten or fifteen years without anybody showing much interest. Uh -huh. So I would say the only piece of advice I could give anybody is when you are a student. Make sure that you stay friends with those people that you worked with. Mm. Because you have something in common, you've all developed at the same time, you will go through your difficulties at the same time, and it will be a kind of support group. Mm. You know, when I was a student, there wasn't the term support group, but th that is actually what I've had. Mm. Um, sadly, people keep dying now, which, you know, <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. but, you know, very irresponsible of them. Um, yeah, well, it is. It is indeed. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you can speak out of a lot of experience because also you've been teaching for what thirty years or something. I was teaching for about thirty years. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's. it's I'm sure it's a means of an income as well. But, but it's I always also, it's, a, it's also very. It can be very enjoyable. I was lucky exactly. to teach at Slade, and there were extremely good students, and I made friends with several of them, and we, I'm still friends with them. Exactly. I also felt. I mean, I've done only a very little uh, teaching engagement with young students, and. I, I always felt it keeps you very fresh and up to on your toes and up to date to a current sort of um, to current concerns. Um, while if you don't, and if you even if you are a successful artist and you work uh, at home or in in your studio in your golden cage, so to say, I mean, you, you kind of lose. You easily can lose the contact and the, yes, the touch. Yes, you can. You can now having having a group of students is it's a little bit like having children, except they are kinder and more polite than most children. So uh, I was just signaled we have a maximum of five minutes left. Five minutes. So um, mm -hmm. we also we've talked for way too long already. Um, people, I, I hope we haven't bored people. But um, people I wanted to ask you three little things, actually, very little, um, in in a talk show kind of context. So um, because architecture is quite important in your way, work, uh, as okay. it was with uh, with your trip to Italy, or also with Aleppo, for example. If there is one, and this is not an age-related question, it's a question related to Corona and travel at, at the moment. If you had one place on the world to, you would, or one architectural site you could visit for that would inform your work as well, um, which one would that be? Well, I knew you were going to ask me this question, so I've had time to think about it. 
uh, there is somewhere, and I will never be able to get there, um, that is the Yemen. I would, uh, yes, uh, that's Sana, uh, the capital, I would <sighs> love to see that. Wow. But, now we know that's not possible. It's it's very very unlikely. It's a very I'm 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 a little bit I'm having a little bit goosebumps when you bring this up because this is really a place that is probably most likely not possible and maybe by the time completely destroyed. I'm afraid so. It's terrible yeah. to see those things. Terrible. The last question in mm. our talk show kind of uh, end to this talk is like, I want to talk, uh, I want to uh, mention that you are smoking. You've been smoking a cigarette <laughs> earlier. And um, I don't want to uh, have any morale issues or something. Um, I just want to say that, you know, it's, it's quite unusual and remarkable. And what do you say about smoking? Well, I can't possibly say I'm in favor of it. I mean, that, that would be absurd. Uh, I'm addicted. We all know about addiction. Luckily, I'm not addicted to drink, so I don't mind going without drink. But I'm addicted to smoking, and I tell myself it's too late to die young. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, uh, I don't think there's a better end to this conversation right now. Um, thank you very much, Tess, for this beautiful hour <laughs> of uh, conversation. Thank you to this session, and I hope this wasn't boring to uh, to uh, visitors or viewers. I in hope the future. so. They don't have to watch. Um, it's slightly unfortunate that we cannot take questions at this moment um, because that would really uh, be ex excellent to hear what people have to say who would be now actual listeners to this. Um, But for now, we, I guess we have to leave it as it is. Um, this talk will be going online in a while. And we hope to have you here towards the end of the show. Um, so you can see the show yourself, of course. And maybe possibly as well, there, is, uh, there can be some, for interested viewers, some possibility to ask questions to you directly if that's an option. Um, <laughs> So thanks a lot, Tess, and um, it was a real pleasure talking to you. And it actually went much easier and um, uh, less nerve-wracking than I thought it would. Oh, very good. Well, thank you very much for taking the trouble, Christian. I'm sorry <laughs> you suffered before. And again, thanks to everybody at the session. And good luck to all, all the young artists and the old artists in Austria. Ciao, Tess. Bye.